We're going to talk quite a bit about ears, not exactly how to draw them, but placement. We've done that a little bit before. Uh, we're going to do it again because it's so critical. So here's a Watteau. I'll show you a few different things. Before we jump into it, I was looking for, uh, for some stuff for you guys. That's why I had that page popped up, I guess. Um, I wanted to show you this site, and let me drop it into the chat. It's uh, probably most of you, oops, most of you know Wikipedia. Uh, that it has kind of, there's iterations. I don't know if it's, uh, it's affiliated, I guess uh, it is, uh, but Wikimedia. And if, if you uh, type in what I just dropped into the chat, commons right up here. Oh, whoops, I didn't help, did it? commons.wikimedia.org uh, right over here. And if you just do Wicca, uh, wiki, sometimes it'll come up. But the, the uh, wonderful thing about this is this is all public domain. See right here, public domain. So you can type in any artist or any reference. You can put in ecrochets, skeletons. It's limited at times in what you can find. It's expansive in others. But if you click on anything in particular, I just clicked on this one. You can click on any of these. They'll come in a sidebar. And then you can see how big the image is. And if it's uh, up into the uh, thousands, then it's going to be a good solid image. And then you click over to it and you can pick whichever image you want. And you can see how big that gets. And then you can just drag it over to your desktop uh, and you can have it for free. And so I've created a library of these things uh, on Google Drive. Some are kind of low res. Most of the ones I pick are higher res. You can see the re resolution here. And uh, I'll get these for my clients, uh, uh, reference for the live streams I'm using with you guys. And you can find illustrators, you can find uh, fine artists. I, I make uh, folders, old master drawings, famous paintings, famous illustrators, famous drawings. Here's photo reference, ecorche folder. And they're all um, copyright free. So anyway, it's a great resource for us. It's uh, mainly dealt with by uh, 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 added to by Google, I think. But I might be wrong with that. But I know they have their own thing where they're shooting really high res images of all sorts of things as a common library. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's what we have there to work from. So... With that, and that was my live stream notice that I just finished. Uh, from that, let's jump into drawing the head. Now we're gonna look at the secondary structures as we did last week. Uh, shape of the face, shape of the skull, and then some of the secondary structures, the forehead, cheekbones, we started to move down into the jaw and chin just a little bit there, getting those because we want to be able to separate the big structures into big planes, what I call box logic, so we can render things darker here and lighter there and so on. And we're going to find then a roadmap, and I do this with everything basically, but then I'll, I'll also think of it as a ball as a tube, but I'll think of it as a box, box logic, and I'll look for the corner of the box. And we're going to use the eye socket and some of the work we did uh, last week uh, to find that uh, that corner. So I'm going to show you how that works. So whatever we're looking at, if I can figure out where the corner is, and I don't have to be exactly right because it's organic, but roughly right, it's going to give me a lot of power to render and render at speed and design and redesign. And so we're going to look at how that looks in profile. And we'll just work out of our head for a while. And then we'll sneak over to look at some reference. I got a ton of reference. We won't have time to go through all of it, but we'll just do it again next week, go farther. So how do we get to there? Or how do we get the reference under control? We're going to look at the shape of the skull. I can do better than that. Shape of the skull, mask of the face. 
And what we'll mo notice here, if we, and I like to draw a lot of painterly lines because I like to bring the energy and I'm drawing from my shoulder here. I'm not doing here. I find if I think about you, if I decide to use little muscles, I get into little details because I have more control. If I work with the big muscles, there's more energy, more like uh, Zorro slashing rather than playing a, a keyboard kind of thing. But more body, more energy, big ideas first, and then I'll move into more detailed work and get into the minutia, tighten down, but that'll go on top of that big foundational work. So I'll work that way. And then since I love to do kind of action figures, then some of these painterly lines end up actually in the finish. And what we'll find is just very roughly the sideburn area, the front of the ear, will be very close to the middle. Notice the way I drew it is not in the middle. I usually will draw in the middle, but I wanted to show you <laughs> that it doesn't have to be perfect. And, dramatic pause. You can change your mind. And I like to change my mind in two different ways. Draw nice and light, and I tend to draw darker on these things so you can see it on camera or in the classroom. Draw nice and light, and then you can always come over with a little more darkened line to correct. Oh, that's where the ear wants to be. That's better. I'll do that, or what's better for your practice is to do the whole thing again. Now I've drawn lots of lines for every mark I'm trying to make, every simplified contour I'm trying to set myself up for. And so I've drawn that head at not once, but several times. If there's six lines there, drawn it six times. And then if I do that and then do it again to make it even simpler or clearer or ring more true or more expressive, more energy, more accuracy of proportion, whatever measure of success I can, I might have, and I'll have different measures of success depending on what I'm doing and why, but then you start to get the feel for it. So we want to be able to draw a simple profile. And then as soon as we get that profile, and notice there's a bit of a corner in each of these where kind of the mask of the face, it might be at the hairline, it might not, it might be a little lower like a Halloween mask or something. But there's an implied moment or actually called out as I just did, a moment where the face meets the skull, goes through. And if I understand that that skull goes back and slightly up and the face goes down and the in or out, depending on the position, but that's slightly more than a right angle there. It's not quite right angle mechanical. A little bit back of skull usually not always lifts up. If I can get that, now I can very quickly with a little practice, establish immediately that a chin is on the chest, maybe, or they're looking down, or looking up. And you'll see this with uh, artists' work when they survive. They'll do these real simple. Fuseli used to actually do box heads on these little mannequins he'd do for compositions for his paintings. So not characteristic at all, but it placed it, it took up space, it showed in the composition where that figure would be. I like to do something more characteristic, but if I can draw it in my head, now I'm visualizing on a simple yet fairly characteristic way what the head looks like. So when I get to real reference, or get to the ambition of a big finish, I've already got clarity of what I'm after. 
and then I get specific with what uh, nature or my resources give to me to actually execute it in, in glorious detail, maybe, or whatever. So we start playing with that. And rather than fussing around and fixing that, I'll draw it again. Uh, that skull to head relationship wasn't right. And I want it smaller for my composition and so on. So practice those very simple things. I'll, I'll do this a lot. Just do these kind of things, or eggs. Just practice my rendering of a shadow. Can I get a soft edge? Can I get a little bit of a core? Can I get a feeling of volume, even though it's simple enough that I'm not fooling anybody that it's a real tube, but get get the bones of what a real tube would be quite quickly, clearly, make decisions. No, I want it to be a darker, more dramatic difference between light and shadow. No, I want more halftone gradation. I want that gradation to be painterly, kind of hatched in gradations. Play with it. Acclimate yourself. Be thinking about it a lot. Dip into your artist self during the day, several times a day. That stuff is pennies in the bank. Over time, it's collecting interest, building on the other little bits of attention you put towards your passion. And over time, it doesn't, it's early on, it doesn't feel like you're doing anything. Over time, it goes crazy. Compound interest. Eighth wonder of the world, Einstein said. Okay, so once we kind of get that simple constructed idea in whatever way we want. Now we want to be able to start taking that two-dimensional design that we got down without a lot of overwhelm, without a lot of stress, with leveling up fairly quickly and sometimes quite quickly from horrible to pretty darn good and maybe pretty fantastic even from drawing to drawing. When we get to there, then we want to start thinking of those two-dimensional shapes, if we haven't already, and I re always recommend going slow, so work with the two-dimensional and then get the three-dimensional. Get this and then get this. Get this and then get this. Ease into the challenges, because there's a lot of them. They stack. But if you take them step by step, little win by little win, Two-dimensional, three-dimensional, line to tone, foreground to background even, whatever it is, ease into it. So once we get that, then fairly soon in our journey, we're going to want to understand where their natural corner is, where a natural corner is. Because if I just render it round, it's going to feel kind of cartoony, especially early on and for a long time, because there's things that get very chiseled, relatively sharper, and other things that get quite round. And if I make it all this round, then that's not going to seem as round. If I can make this a little square, that'll be a little rounder. If I can mash up and make it not all eggs, but eggs and tubes and boxes, it's going to seem more sophisticated, even though it's just a little more attention to simple shapes and seeing how they they mash up here and how the shadow shapes might change apply here and so on those little things build up over time it makes you masterful if you stick with those little things understand those little things so if we go back in time a little bit, I believe, I didn't double check, but I believe we're talking about three quarter views a little bit and well, in front views, three quarter in front views. And we found that the forehead as defined by the eyebrows is more narrow than the cheeks. And the foreheads give us a sense of the bottom plane of the forehead. The eyebrows do, I think I said forehead there twice. Um, gives us the arch 
and then the descent gives us the difference between a simplified front plane and the side or corner planes, however you want to think about it. And when we end just kind of schematically over in an oversimplified way, in the bottom of the forehead, right at the eye line, just for convenience, good landmark, and then let those eyebrows descend down. That takes us natu naturally, and with a little bit of practice, effortlessly. I can't say either one of those words very well. Down along the cheeks, towards the jaw. And we're not going to, again, not going to do much around the um, lower part of the face. So we then get a natural box logic. We know where some of the front planes are for these secondary, still large forms on that primary mask of the face. We know where the cheeks turn back. And now we can start organizing things uh, in terms of setting up for three-dimensional ideas and rendering like that. So we, when we get to a three-quarter view, <clears throat> all we're doing is using the L, the T, center line, eyebrow line. It could be the eye line. I tend to use the, the eyebrow line, but we could use either one or both. L, T. Notice we don't get that L going back on a front view. Here it is on a profile. And then another L, wherever that eyebrow, front of the eyebrow cheekbone happens back there. Now we get a third L, LTL. And that gives us all the three-dimensional information we need because we're getting the length, the width, and the depth. Sometimes you see all of, all three letter callouts. Sometimes you only see really one, in a sense. But you get what you can get out of it. And then if we put in those simplified eyebrows, then we'll feel the forehead, depending on the head in relationship to the light source, the front of the forehead might be in light, it might be in shadow. We'll reverse it from over here. And then those eyebrows descend down and just structurally, schematically, hit the eye line where the upper lid meets the lower lid. I'm just shooting through that. Or just the outside corners of where upper meets lower, just hitting those two points, those whatever. Doesn't have to be exactly right because we'll adjust it, refine it. That gives us our wider cheekbone. Cheekbone is the widest part of the face, wider than the eyebrows. Chin is the narrowest part of the face narrower than the eyebrow forehead area. And now we have that kind of box logic. And then once we understand the landscape, then we can add the features in the eyeball and the eye socket, the secondary subtler forms of the forehead, temple area, all that kind of stuff, corner planes. And we can find, uh, trap, uh, map out the features and place them with their little structures on the bigger structure. So going back again then to a profile, I want to find that same set of landmarks, eyebrow, to eyeline cheekbone. That's going to be the critical, 
that's going to be kind of the, the center where we can build everything off of that solid set of landmarks. Eyebrows are going to fall or come up and end or drop back down. There's going to be a natural place where it feels like it's kind of the corner. We'll just use that. We'll refine it later. Good enough. It's here. It's here. It's here. Anywhere in there. So there, and then we're just going to fall down to that eye line. There's my cheekbone. This is all front. This is all side. Go up, over, up. This is all front. This is all side. We're good. On the profile, though, we don't have both eyebrows. We don't have both arches. We don't have both eyes. We got half the picture. So what we'll do there is realize that when we've drawn this kind of zigzag action from the narrow forehead to the wider cheek to hold the eye socket, eyeball, <clears throat> this is more or less, that's a little more actually, but it's good enough, more or less the eye socket, the outside of the eye socket. And if we look at that, there's that corner forehead comes down and out to the wider cheek and into the more narrow chin, which we don't have here. And notice how it's the transition of down and out is tracking with the flesh covering it, the rim of that orbit, eye socket. That's all we're gonna use. We can make it nice and boxy, zigzaggy, or my nice and rounded and S-curvy. Those are technical terms, by the way. So all I'm gonna do then, I need to find the eyebrow eye line again. And then I'm going to build an eye socket on it. And you can do that any way. You can know your proportions and know that uh, bottom of the chin to the top of the head here, actually, not the hairline, but top of the skull. About halfway through is the eye line. The eyes sit about halfway through. I like a little more heroic characters. So I usually put it up a little higher. If I need to, I'll add more skull or less chin or whatever. I can adjust it. It'll be right in there. Eyebrows will be in there. What will oftentimes ha help, and notice what happens if I, uh, let's go back here a second. Oops. Notice that if I just put in the eye line and the eyebrow line, and even if I did the eye, eyebrow, eyebrow line, a little more characteristic, notice how flat this gets. Here's the forehead. There's the nose. There's the lips. See how flat that gets? See how it doesn't give us hardly any sense at all, if any, at all, of it rolling in my, I guess I should do this way for the time. I'm rolling this way. I guess that's right, my screen's reversed, so I'm confusing myself. We're not getting any sense of this, it's all this. It's all making you feel like it's side plane. And then when we try and add on the features, it looks kind of cartoony. So we need to be able to tell them, give them visual clues that it's wrapping around. And so that's always the problem in three-dimensional structure, is you have to teach your audience not how to just 
move around the form because that makes it flat. That looks like a shadow on the wall. We have to teach them how to move over the form. So in some way or another, we have to break the contour, which is our shadow silhouette, and move them up and over to feel like they're underneath it or down and under to feel like they're on top of it. We have to give depth clues by telling them not just how to get over to the other side, but how to journey over that volume and over that volume in whatever character it is, square or rounded, rounded, rounded. My words are failing me here or more convoluted for all a combination, of all of those things. So there's a lot of work we have to do. Every line we draw is a visual arrow with momentum. And the laws of, of, uh, of uh, thermodynamics, a, is it thermodynamics? Some dynamics, the Newton laws or <laughs> I'll say it with authority, even though I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, a body that uh, is in motion will tend to stay in motion. So when I draw a line, I stop. You're going to keep going, try and connect it. So my lines stop, but you keep going this way when I want you to go around that way somehow. That's a problem. We gotta solve that. Let's solve that. How are we doing on time? I have one minute to solve it. Now we'll go a little later as we usually do. Okay, and now I'm talking to myself, so let's let's get back to it. Okay, so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna get a sense of where that eyebrow is. And, and the eyebrow line and eye line are. Once we get that, we're going to be in great shape, literally. And if a big simple form is too big or too simple, I'll make it smaller. I'll break it into smaller pieces. And I'll try and make those pieces more characteristic. It doesn't have a pointy back of the head. It's not that wide. Fits here. This isn't quite that curved, but it is a little longer fits here. I think the ear is about there. I'm going to get a simplified hairline or not so simplified hairline, maybe even the eyebrow and let those now several, I really have four um, things I put in. I did, did the shape of this, the whole shape of the head. And then I added the shape mask of the face and the shape of the skull into that head. And I added the ear. I'll just do that so we can distinguish. Like so, I'm breaking into smaller pieces so I can get more clear on the proportions of the whole head. And if I draw nice and light, I can correct right on the fly over the same drawing, or I can work with it, you know, work, work iterations on that. And as I get more information, I can make, I can become ever more discriminating, but I'll get to a place where it feels like it rings true. It's good enough. And I'll stop there. And now when I add the, a new thing, it's going to help me reevaluate everything I've done. I think this is great. I think it's one of the best things I've ever done. Now, instead of doing the eyebrow and eye like a cartoon, I'm going to draw this whole eye socket right here. But I'm going to use the eyebrow to do it. Because the eyebrow is going to do that in some manner or form, as we learned. 
It's just that to do it here, I'm being a little silly with that, of course, to do it here doesn't give us the structure we need. It's confusing because the arrows are not going around, they're just going up and down. It's not helpful. Not helpful. By the way, uh, I should say I have a little bit of homework, Mike reminded me. Uh, just a quick mention, if you like uh, these programs, we're just going to do them every week, give or take a holiday or a sick day, because uh, I love doing them. And so if you love them, spread the word. Let other people know. They're free. Give you. I'm going to try and give you as much as I can on these things over the months and the years here. We're, gonna do, we're in it for the long term. So join us. I appreciate that. But also tell your friends. Tell several friends. Spread it around. It helps us to know that we're helping other people. And then we also have a few products. This is not one of them. It's free. But I've got some prints. I just started one. Mike set up our little Spotify account for it. We got one print available. We're going to have several more here coming out in the next uh, week or two, really, pretty quick. Two or three more. We'll start out probably with three, maybe four. See how it goes and then adjust. But anyway, we have prints uh, that you can look into. Mike will drop that, the... Uh, information on that uh, in the webs in the uh, chat space. Uh, we've got our Patreon channel where you can support because it takes a little bit of manpower, me and my team uh, and Mike, who's my partner, uh, it takes all of us some, some uh, energy, some time to do this and we have limited time. So we oftentimes pay people. So pitching in a little bit on that helps. And then we have a, our my Draws from Life course, which is high ticket, more like a college education with more like college, small college, but still college prices. Any or all those things, if you're interested, just reach out to us. Michael drop links or emails to, uh, to um, start that process. And with that being said, let's get back to the fun stuff. Okay, so what I want to do then is I just, let's get a little darker here. I'm going to not be quite as silly. I'm going to keep that, this interior part of my eyebrows fairly horizontal. He's looking down fairly horizontal, maybe tipping up a little bit. And then I'm going to do the downstroke, not as the hair of the eyebrow, but I'm going to think of, Think of it as the eye socket. And when I do that, everything in front of that is front of the face. And in this case, I've decided that the light is going to be behind it. And so everything that moves this way or this way will be dark shadow. Just calling it out as a simple separation, a simple rule. Anything that turns the front plane, I'm going to make dark just so I can distinguish it, just because that's what the light source is doing in my reference, whatever. But that's going to be the corner. And what will what I think of when I do that to make it easier. And to give me a visual I won't forget. And if we clean this up a little bit and pop it out from all these sketchy beginnings, we'll notice the arch of the eyebrow might be quite square. Mine aren't, but oftentimes they are. And then it's going to roll into that corner of the cheek, the wider corner. And start moving down. It starts forward and falls like a waterfall, like a ski slope. Forward to protect the eye. That's that bone structure coming out to protect. And then drops down to move into the mouth and the chin and to, not, and to set back for the nose. It'll pull here. The nose will be out here. And all of this will be front of the face. The nose is going to pop out. That'll be a conversation for another day. But everything I'm just going to push into shadow so I can see that separation. Front side. Now I've got structure. Now I've got box logic. And now I can play with it. But what I like to do is when I have these kind of little, uh, little processes of development for whatever I'm doing, 
I try and come up with some simple way to remember them, some visual that pops into my head if I see the if I say the word, it gives me a clear understanding of what I'm trying to do. So I think of that as a whistle notch. If this weren't were not ahead, and oh by the way, notice when I've added this stuff, I realize what I may not have realized before. Everything becomes a measuring stick for everything else. And if I'm thoughtful enough to not just do one thing and then the other and check that off, but as I get one thing, I go back and compare it to all the other things. When I get something else, I try and make it right, but also right in relationship to all the other things. And so each thing becomes a measuring uh, a measuring tool, a yardstick, a way to double check each other thing so everything is composed, everything's working together. As I get more information, I make more, ever more refined adjustments and choices around what I've got down. But what I will think of, if we just look at a tube again, if we were goofing around with late, uh, a little earlier, what I think of uh, as the eye sock, and the, those of you who've studied with me a little bit will know where I'm going with this, I think of it as a whistle notch. And the whistle notch is created if we do a perspective tube so we can see it. If it were not a perspective tube, wouldn't really be like that, but it would be, but that's a nice simple version of, of something. A whistle notch would just be out like this, just taking a chunk out. So if we turn that into a head, just a chunk out. And we can choose to make that as deep as we want. We can also choose to make it a square notch on top. A more angry notch, it looks like and a rounder on the bottom, so we can iterate that any way we want. But it gives us a sense of that corner, and it will intrude in as much as it intrudes in. And you can see as I start putting a, a thick value along that border, it does, in fact, start to, I'll cheat on the perspective, look like a little bit of box logic there. When we tip it into deeper space, then we need to know a little bit about ellipses. And we know that if we're underneath something, or we learn this, if we're underneath something, the center, anything at or near the center tends to get higher. Anything at or near the edges tends to get lower. So both the eyebrow and the cheekbone, as they go towards the center, they're going to want to get higher if they're in perspective. And just like the ends of our tube, the uh, cheekbone, and I'll push this way up, higher away from the arrows here, and the eyebrows would track on this trajectory because of the tilt of the whole tube or the whole head. So the cheekbone would start going this way, it's just not going to get all the way over the other side like that might, or like a jawline might in a beveled way. And then it's going to fall back down and cut off. And the cheekbone, if they're high cheekbones, might go up a little higher. Eyebrow might go a little higher, a little lower. But roughly, it's going to track that perspective line. This is all eye socket. So I think of a, let's keep this rounded here. Now, I think of the eye socket that holds the eyeball as a whistle notch. If you get a whistle and look at it, tilt it, you'll see it does just this. This construction wraps around, this construction wraps around. They do exactly the same thing on a well-drawn ellipse. This is not particularly well-drawn ellipse, but it tucks back around, comes down, tucks back around and hides 
behind the cheekbone, which tracks eyebrow, which tracks, and then it can get a little more characteristic to that person's eyebrow and that person's cheekbone. So it might vary a little bit, of course, but this is inside and underside of that socket, just like this is of the bottom of our bucket or tube. So I think of a whistle notch. And as soon as I get playing with that, I can start to tilt the whole head and that becomes part of the fun of it. I can just with a decently composed, simple structure and I can get more zigzaggy or more rounded. Still think of it as a whistle notch. Eye sits in there someplace. Nose is in here. Eyebrow to ear. And now all of a sudden, we talked about this uh, before, but just with very simple few marks, where I put the ear and how I relate it to the eye socket. Now it's getting sh shallow because we're behind. Maybe we see a little bit of the lashes, a little bit of the nose and the lips. We can see how that works in relationship And we can quickly see, once we start looking at relationships, if we don't like a relationship. We can make an adjustment. And when we look at our lovely resources, then I'm going to start getting really curious about where the ear is compared to the eye socket. Oops. And if I take that same idea, break it down however I need to, to find what I need to find. Maybe I won't even do the skull because I'm not sure where it's at. I'll do this hair or head wrap, whatever the heck it is. There's a Van Dyke, or no, there's a Rubens drawing, I'm sorry. And then I'll get my, where the eyebrow is. I'll take my whistle notch out in the cheekbone. I'll notice that I might see a little bit of eye lid, eyeball, or eyelashes in there. It's going to be overlapping the nose, and in this case, the mustache and beard. That kind of Santa Claus setup. But what's most important is not that front of the face with all those critical features that make a face a face that allow us to recognize. It's the eye socket to the ear. And the closer that eye socket and ear become, the more it's turning away from us. And the higher that eye socket to ear high to low relationship gets, the more it's lifting up or lifting up and tipping back or whatever. And in this case, it's doing both. And then very quickly, we can start to get what we need to get just by placement. And then I like to look at things and see if I like the placement. Watteau is one of my favorite draftsmen. But for me, the uh, skull's a little big. Now, it's part of the hairstyle, but it makes the, the uh, neck feel thick. And now I'm criticizing a master. It's a good thing. I could be completely wrong. That's okay. But I want to start to discriminate. What do I like about this and what don't I like? I want to do something different. I'll steal from somebody else. I'm still going to steal. I'll just steal from something that rings truer to me, that feels more beautiful to me. And so I'll get critical of these things and take a look at them and make uh, choices around it. And then when we get 
to reference that's more, uh, more on the nose, I'll find that same eyebrow. Look at that eyebrow peak up. Maybe I will have had to find the hairstyle, the side sweeping bangs on top of the skull or replacing the skull. I would encourage you to try and visualize where the skull is, even if you're wrong. Because if you're wrong, you're going to come up with a hairstyle, but it, it gives you the true connection of where that neck is, how the forehead fits, and so on. And maybe I'll just put a mark of where I think the pupil and iris are. But what I want is that eye socket. And I might choose not to actually draw it because it's not clear here at all. It's not showing up in the shadow and light patterns. Well, not, not it's not true at all, but uh, not very strongly. Uh, but I'll still draw it. And then it's going to be front of the face, side of the face. And now that also breaks it into a smaller piece along with the little more or a lot more characteristic hairstyle. It gives me a better chance of getting that ear placed well. And that jaw. And I'll constantly be adding little, relatively little things, like a nose, like an eye socket, like a construction lines, to get a better read on the big things. And as I add each new thing, I compare it to the old things, to what it is or what I wish it would be to be. I'm going to make more heroic, more heroic character because I like those, and I do. So I'll give him a thicker neck, give him a bigger chin, whatever it is. And then if I start paying attention to that corner, Notice what happens. How are we doing on time? We're going to stop here. Notice how the tones get lighter. right here. And they get darker. Now I'm exaggerating it. They're getting darker right there. Notice how all the front planes are a little darker than the side planes. And especially the side corner, we, when we get back to the side and it starts to turn back into kind of the opposing corner, it gets darker again. And then when it really turns back, it gets really dark. See how by separating the little things in a way that's looking for boxes, now I'm finding the corners of the boxes. And that corner is going to separate the values of the boxes. This side will get lighter or darker. This side will get darker or lighter. And we can map out then on every th big thing and every little thing. Every time it turns back, it gets a little darker. Every time it turns forward, it's a little lighter. Turns a little light back, a little darker. A lot back, a lot darker, and so on. And we can then get real control of this really quickly.